from TM Call too. So, so helpful. I found this podcast early on in my pregnancy, knowing that I was interested in more, a more natural birth, but not knowing much else beyond that. I binged every episode, some of them more than once, took notes, joined the class, and now at 30 weeks, my husband and I feel confident that we are preparing as best we can. I love that they present all the information options for you as unbiased as possible and really empower you to know and do what's best for your body and baby. I'm so thankful for this resource and how much information this podcast has provided for free. What a gift. <laughs> but trust me, the class and workbook are worth every penny. Thank you, my essential birth team. Okay. And you get to hear from part of the my essential birth team being my husband. How fun is that? Um, if you guys leave a review, just so that you know, you might get the extreme blessing of having my dear sweet husband read it when he gets to join me on a podcast episode. So do it just for that. Make it a really good one oh, that you can imagine him reading. On the screen. <laughs> hey, bud. <laughs> Um, and and I'll have him read it, and, and you can even request what kind of voice you want that read in. I do many accents. Here with me. I'm sorry. Just go sit right there. You have to stay there, okay? <laughs> Cute. All right. Um, okay. All right, you guys, this week is super special. I have an incredible guest. I am actually gonna read just a small bio about him because it is good and it's gonna tell you a little bit about him and then I'm gonna have him introduce himself as well. Um, but his name is David Arell and he's an author, a consultant, a men's coach. He's also a dad. He's currently living in Colorado Springs. He's passionate about coaching men on how to more fully embrace and embody healthy masculinity, especially through the powerful modalities of partnership and parenting. His most recent work in this area Area is the book which I have with me here welcome to fatherhood the modern man's guide to pregnancy childhood nope to pregnancy childbirth and fatherhood better known as WTF in WTF David encourages men to more actively step into their important supportive roles during pregnancy childbirth and the fourth trimester back home and gives them detailed and practical tips and techniques on how to do so I am so excited to have him here um, David will you take a moment tell me a little bit about your family and honestly I want to know what brought the passion for this book sure thanks Stephanie appreciate it and Michael good to see you here today um, Right now, we're, as I mentioned, we're living in Colorado Springs uh, with my wife. She's a pediatric nurse practitioner and our two kids who are now five and three. So I'm a few years removed from the beautiful experience of going through the pregnancy journey. Um, we also have a giant chocolate lab named Johnny Biscuits who keeps us all on our toes <laughs> and sometimes knocks us off our feet. So uh, join the Colorado lifestyle, outdoor sunshine, plenty of fresh air and fun. And, uh, I love it. Thanks so much. Thank you. And as far as the inspiration for the book, um, I, you know, I guess the shortest answer is I wrote the book that I wish I had a chance to read going through that first pregnancy. As a dad that was really a dad to be that really wanted to be involved and was excited about you know becoming a father and wanting to be a great partner for my my pregnant wife, you know, I, I felt I was out there looking for books and you know guidance and I didn't really find anything that landed for me in like a a way that really I was like oh good this is helpful I mean there's a lot of stuff out there a lot of it seemed to kind of go in the encyclopedic end of the spectrum like week 18 this little tiny thing's gonna happen a week 19 and I'm like okay that's great but that didn't really land <laughs> for me in any sort of like well so what well, now what you know so yeah. Yeah, I tried to write the, this is the basics, this is what you need to know, this is what you need to do, and kind of broke it down ac according to the time of the journey, and just make it real easy and real digestible without pandering to like boobs and beer jokes, or getting too off into the deep end about, you know, developmental stages of eyelashes and hiccuping and whatnot. So somewhere in the middle there is what I was shooting for. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I This is why I brought my husband on this episode today. I feel like you guys are going to relate and have a great conversation. I'm just going to be watching on the side here. Oh, all right. Um, <laughs> but I do, I want to take a minute. Um, uh, David has been so kind as to offer the listeners um, a free copy. Not all of them. It is a giveaway. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm not putting you on the spot there. Um, to his book. So you guys, if you want to enter that, all you have to do is head to Apple Podcasts 
uh, scroll down to pregnancy and birth made easy. Scroll down to the bottom where it says write a review. Click on that. Leave your stars. Write me a review and then send an email to hello at myessentialbirth.com. Just a copy paste of your review because it takes a couple days to get there. And then I'll go ahead and run the like spinny wheel on Instagram and I'll announce the winner and I'll send out the book. So thank you so much for offering that as well, David. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so I thought it would be really fun, kind of like a first time dads thing. I wanna have my husband here. I want you to talk about this. I love the conversation. Um, and I think when we talked originally, right, it was like you you were excited about being this first time dad, right, even before your baby was born. But just like you mentioned, there were things happening with mom that don't really relate to dad. And so I think, I mean, for moms, right, it's easy, like we get pregnant and we instantly feel like there is another person inside of us. Like you feel their spirit, you're connected to them, you think about them all day, you feel every kick, every little hiccup. Um, and obviously it's just not the same for dad a little bit. So we just hear about it. <laughs> yeah, I thought maybe you guys could describe like, yeah, what was that like to kind of step into that? I, my wife says she's pregnant. What does this look like for me? What were like the first thoughts, the first feelings? Well, I think my first thought when we found out we were pregnant is I was super excited. And, you know, we decided to share that news with our close family right away, just so we had a built in um, team to kind of go along that journey with us. Um, but after that initial excitement wore off, it was sort of a, it was definitely a thing that was happening kind of over there with my wife. Like you mentioned, you're feeling the spirit connecting in, you're, you're having all of your, um, you know, food and smell and taste and all the changing wardrobe things. And for me, and this, I hear this from so many guys, they're just sort of like on the side, like, okay, great. I'm, I'm still me. I feel literally completely unchanged. I'll, I'll be a dad when the baby gets here. For example, our first due date was in the very beginning of August and father's day is in June. And my wife got me a card and I was really puzzled. I'm like, uh, I'm not a dad yet. Like you wouldn't get me a graduation card in January if I'm graduating in June. <laughs> would you like, that's just the way so many of us guys think like I'll be a dad when baby gets here. And obviously for, my wife and for all the women out there, you're a mom the minute you know you're pregnant. Sometimes you even know before, before it's confirmed, like, oh, I know, I, I can feel it. So that experiential yeah. gap is not, it's not really bridgeable, but it's connectable. And that's kind of one of the big taglines of the book, better connected. It's like, you're never gonna be able to really know, your partner's having her journey, you're having yours, but you can connect to her journey so that you can better support it, you can better see it, and, and be sympathetic and share in her experience without it being your version versus her version. I don't know, Michael, was that, how does that resonate with your first pregnancy journey? If you can even remember, yeah, it's like, these are, these are like lifetimes ago, right? <laughs> it, it is. Yeah, exactly. It's like it never happened. Yeah. Wait. Well, I mean. <laughs> Hold up. <laughs> wait, wait a second. Yeah, you're, you're mostly disconnected. You assume that because everybody's done it forever that you'll have no issue going into it. You don't need, you know, too much training. Her body's got this doctors have this and you'll go along with whatever courses she pops up. But other than that, you just kind of are there for support almost. And, but you don't really know what that is. So, yeah. Well, it's funny. I had one of the guys that, that I was coaching tell me exactly his version of that was like, okay, but what's the big deal? We all, we all got here this way. I mean, maybe there's a test tube baby somewhere, but like, Billions of people have been born this way. It's, I don't understand what the, what I'm supposed to do other than be excited. So there's a, there's a lot of that out there. But then for our partners, it's like, yeah. this is the absolute biggest deal ever. Like graduation, <laughs> wedding, anything you wanna mix in and add it together, becoming pregnant is still a bigger deal than all the rest of that. So that that's that experiential gap I like to kind of connect, like mentioned for the guys out there. I love that. I actually, I did read through um, quite a, a bit of your book. I thumbed through it and something that you had talked about, which I love and I feel like I would just, I mean, this is a whole podcast episode on its own, but that's just like the traditional roles of men and women, like what it used to be like versus what it is now. And particularly in the United States, what that looks like for a man and what's expected of you now um, and what a woman needs versus what she gets, even, you know, in this village that we have, this village, right? Um, and you kind of talked about how it used to be that like 
women used to be at each other's births. Family used to give birth together and you'd have a midwife and all the women would be there, you know, helping each other and loving on her. And she has the baby and, she, and they're there for support after. And the guy's kind of like, I'm going to go, you know, kill an animal and bring back the meat and <laughs> like take care of you this way. And you've got your your thing and I'm doing mine. And now it's like, well, now we need you to be loving and nurturing and you need to be by my side and you have to know how to hold my hand and speak to me. And like, and it, it, that is important. And today's man, I do need to hear those things from you. But I do think there's something to that when you're talking about those traditional roles and the differences here. And then now, you know, in that space, so what is a father to do? And I think you touch on that really, really well. I have to tell you, just as a compliment to you, like you've done your homework. Like I read this and I'm like, yes, like he has taken the classes. He supported his wife. He knows what he's talking about. I mean, even the way that you were talking about the different stages of labor. And I'm like, this is a man that cares about his woman enough to like learn this stuff and be there for her. But those traditional roles, I think, are you hit that just dead on. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. And those traditional roles, what's so tricky about them is that, A, they're largely invisible. So it's not like you get like right. the, the uniform and the badge and like the training, like your role <laughs> today is to do this. And so we're all kind of figuring out what these new roles look like. There's not a lot of great cultural support when it comes to helping, especially us guys, like what does it mean to be connected to our partner. You know, I, I joke in the book, we all hear about being helpful and supportive, but like, oh, oh great. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of starting with that idea, but what does that look like? Like, tell me more specifically. And then we're sort of guessing a lot and our poor partners, most of the time, assuming it's a first pregnancy, they haven't been on this journey before. They don't know what they need. And maybe yesterday they did need X and today X is the absolute last thing they want to see or taste or eat or whatever, you know? So right. both, both pieces are moving and there's a lot of unknowns and it just sort of creates a lot of stress. And so one of the things I like to recommend, you know, from pregnancy onward, especially at, you know, once baby gets here is for each partner to sort of exhale a little bit and give their, their partner a little bit of space and grace is what I like to say that this is new. We, we are learning, we are trying, and it, it's not really fair to like tell somebody they're doing something wrong. If you haven't, if they don't know what right looks like. And so this is sort of a like live learning exercise and just, you know, giving each other that little bit of space and grace, like, Hey honey, I'm really trying here. I, I want to be connected or I know you're trying. I see that you're doing these things. I really appreciate the effort. And just keeping those like bonds of communication and appreciation open and that creates a more fertile ground for those those new habits, those new newly um, discovered ways of being connected through pregnancy, childbirth, and then of course into, par into parenthood. That's just a much fertile ground for those connections to thrive in, in my opinion. So that, that's kind of what I recommend, space yeah. and grace. Yeah, I, th mm -hmm. I think that's huge because I'll tell you, you know, early on, like we got better by the third pregnancy, but I was it like, took three. Yeah. <laughs> it took three, but I was like, why aren't you doing in my head? Right? Like, why is he, he doing this? And why, you know, all this stuff that I'm expecting of him, but I wasn't, we don't realize, I think, or we don't respect the space that men are going through. And this is a change for them too. You know, everything's happening to our body. So it's really easy to kind of turn inward and be like, but this is my thing. And but it, it's not, you know, this changes for men. And I know that we'll get to this when we kind of push on to the postpartum side of things. But, you know, men go through baby blues and stuff, too. Like this is an extreme change in everyone's life. And so, I mean, I have talked about that on the podcast before, because I do think there's kind of this like situational thing that happens within, you know, I don't know. I want to say within the United States, because that's what I'm aware of. But where we talk, even as we talk as women, and it's like, we need to be kind in the way that we're speaking about our men. We need to be open to hearing their side of what they're feeling. I mean, I don't know if I asked you once, like, how are you feeling about all this? You know, it took us <laughs> three pregnancies and some counseling, it was right? Mostly, what are you doing about this? <laughs> yes. Right, right. <laughs> it, was, it was a different yeah. conversation. And so once we got to that place, I mean, my husband... And I'll let you talk about it a bit later, but, um, you know, he, he, same thing. He's like, I wasn't doing well postpartum and I didn't know to ask for help and I didn't know to say anything. And, and that's a big deal. So I love that you touched on that. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you.
Yeah. Okay. So I want to kind of, because this is a pregnancy and birth podcast, I want to walk us through kind of those um, different stages of labor. Well, I want to talk about pregnancy and how you prepare for that and then kind of the stages of labor onto postpartum. And I want you, if you're okay with it, I want to hear from both of you, but I'm really interested to hear what you have to say to dads about these are like my top tips for these things. You're kind of like do these things. Sure, sure. So tell me about pregnancy what are your like top tips this you should absolutely do this with your wife or for yourself to prepare i think sticking with the tagline of better connecting to your partner one of the things i recommend really strongly to the guys out there is to find a pet name for your growing baby like in the book i say baby is not an it because a lot of us guys tend to think oh yeah. it how is how is it the pregnancy progressing um but that your wife or or your girlfriend does not have an it in her belly. She has a baby, and it, and it, and you want to personalize that connection and by coming up with a pet name. Um, we used Poppy for our first pregnancy because we found out <laughs> so early that at the time baby was the size of a poppy seed. We did those like little videos each week, you know. So it's very easy for us to refer to Poppy and like make our baby a person as they were developing, rather than just a a medical condition or state, et cetera. So. I always tell the guys, find a fun pet name, stick with that. And number two, you know, know the week of your pregnancy because so many of us guys are like, I don't know, how far along is it? And they're like, oh, four or five months. Like, and a guy will say that like with a straight face. Like, like it's just <laughs> not, that information's not something that they're really connected to. But again, from your partner's point of view, this is a week by week, literally day by day, hour by hour changing experience. So the more you can sort of, see her experience reflect that in your language and the way you orient to her i think that'll be really helpful those connections and then for getting prepared which is the other part of the tagline um number one i would say take a birth class with your partner that's a great teamwork experiential exercise that you can go through together which sort of counteracts most of uh what our guys tend to think of teamwork which is you go do that i'll go do this over here and we cannot see each other for two months and still be an awesome team because I'm doing my half of the job and you're doing your half. Whereas a lot of uh, you know the, the mamas I talked about, their teamwork means do this right here with me, like literally sitting next to me. So uh, a birth <laughs> class is a great opportunity to, to crush the teamwork in a way that she can see and feel and appreciate. And then the second thing I th throw in there is, and I, this is probably the tip I'm the most strong about for pregnancy, which is dude, hire a doula. That's dad tip number seven. And a doula is not just there for your wife or your girlfriend. She's there for you too. Like our doula was fantastic. And I know we have short time, so I won't, I won't get into some of the anecdotes, but our doulas, we had a doula for our first birth and our second one. And both times they were just as important to helping me and my journey as they were to helping my wife and her journey. So that's like the strongest tip in the book as far as how much I, I don't just suggest it, I sort of like demand it. Like this will make everybody's life easier, including yours, dad. So that's those are my two connecting and two preparing like hit tips for the pregnancy journey. Yeah, and the doula doesn't take over for you. They're there to support you. That's the one of the key things. It's like, you're like, I didn't go through all this training and practice and exercise to hire somebody in here to do the job that I was preparing to do this whole time. It's not like that at all. The best way I've had it relayed to me, which I say all the time is, it's like you're the head coach and they're your offensive coordinator. You're still running the team. They're there calling some of the plays that are helping you out so you can focus on all these other things that you want to turn out the right way. That's, that's it, exactly, it like that's, a great, that's a great metaphor, Michael. Thank you. Yeah. That one's not mine. It happened in our birth class, though. Yeah, so. yeah and I'll, I'll circle back to this when we get into the to the actual childbirth um, to you know really lay a little bit more weight into the the role of the doula versus your role. Yeah, hmm. I love it. Um, I actually, so yeah, we can do that. Well, let's move on to the labor and birth. What does that look like for a dad supporting? supporting his woman um and doing it in a way that feels you know good natural authentic to him instead of maybe what we're requesting <laughs> well that that's a great segue there stephanie because so much of what us guys are hearing out there from requests is basically like dads you need to be everything for everybody everywhere at all times you need to watch the room you need to like make sure that whatever's happening is within our birth preferences and you need to be prepared. 
to push back against a an intervention that maybe we're not comfortable with. Oh, and you also need to be holding my hand and you need to be rubbing my back and you can't leave, but you need to stay hydrated <laughs> and don't take a nap, but get coffee, but don't leave. It's like, yeah. And this is where like having your birth. Bring me team. ice chips, but don't leave. <laughs> right, right. Or yeah. in the transition, I hate you, but don't leave me, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the classic dilemma of all men everywhere. It's you're expected to always be at home with your family and giving them all the love and attention they could ever possibly need and want. You're also expected to be working constantly to provide for that family. Right. And that shows up in the delivery so. room. And that's where, you know, the homework part of like getting your birth team together, specifically your doula really allows you to sort of outsource some of that stuff that you were talking about, Michael, like the offensive coordinator, like you can outsource to your doula, like, Hey, why don't you watch the room and let me know if there's something I need to pay attention to. And why don't you help me by rubbing my wife's back where I can stay connected to her on the front side where she can see me and I can hold her hand and like rubber brow and whatnot. Um, yeah. But the, the basic mantra I tell guys that, that, that will inform your whole labor experience is this guy has three parts. It's be attentive, be calm, and then be competent. And if you can do those things, and especially staying focused on those first two, then everything else will be a lot easier. Like pay, just pay attention to your partner. Like, does she need this? Does she need that? Is she in a space where she's fine? Your doula's there. Maybe you can run down and grab some lunch and come back if you've been there for a while. Or if you're having a home birth, you can, you know, run and get, let the dog out and come back. But like, you need to be attending to your partner so you're connecting and supporting her as needed. And then when you do get a chance to take a little mental break, you should take that for yourself. Like, you you shouldn't feel like you need to be standing there staring at her for, you know, what could be hours at a time. So be attentive, be calm. And that's where like learning, you know, your birth class information or having your doula there who you could sort of outsource like, the situational awareness stuff, like let me know when I can be more attentive and more effective. And then with, again, be competent, like, you know, some, maybe you are holding a leg and you're squeezing. And for our first birth, uh, there was a point in time where my wife couldn't hear anybody in the hospital. We were in a hospital, in the hospital room besides me. So she couldn't hear what the uh, OB was asking her. She couldn't hear what anybody was at. It was all just sounded like Charlie Brown's teacher. So she needed me to like be really close to her and basically passing along the information and, um, you know, helping her with her comfort measures. Uh, but I was able to do that because I had my doula kind of watching my back, watching the room and I had, I was paying attention to her and I was, I was engaged and present and connected. So, you know, tell the guys like, put down the camcorder. You don't need to be the videographer. Maybe, you know, maybe you take a few pictures, but like, again, just stay focused and connected to mama and what she needs. And the rest of the experience will go so much easier. A calm, a, a mom that feels connected and and supported and then can relax, you know, given the givens as much as possible is gonna have an easier labor than a mom that's anxious if she's worried about her partner, about dad's, what dad's doing or whether they're, you know, who's in the room and whatnot. So the more you can, you and the birth team can sort of soothe and support mama the oxytocin can do its job without the adrenaline kicking in and the fear and the nervousness sort of like counteracting it. So you want to be that emotional present um, rock of dependability throughout that birth and let everything else kind of be outsourced to other people, to your offensive coordinator as it is. <laughs> yeah. And I think part of being competent too is, so with the first births that we had, we had taken a hospital course and didn't really practice. I just figured... Yeah, I get the basics. We can wing it. I'm pretty good under pressure. Things did not go the way we wanted. And second, we had taken a birth course and we still didn't really practice as much. And so my point in that is I think competency, like you're saying, is a great point. And I think going along with competency is actually putting in the work and the practice and making sure you're connected enough with your spouse prior to game day that all the practice leading up to that has prepared you for that. Yeah. Um, I have to, David, when we spoke before, and I thought this was such a great point, and I have to, if I'm being honest and 
uh, just trying to be real here. I don't know that I saw it from this perspective. And so I really appreciated that. You know, one of the things that I do talk about and teach and kind of preach, and I know that I asked you to do, and you mentioned was that kind of advocacy for mom. And you had mentioned though, that like, we're not going to step in there and talk to these people that are licensed and professionals and all this and tell them they're doing it wrong to be able to stand up for this mom, you know, necessarily. Like it's it's kind of this uncomfortable, weird situation. So I want to ask, and I'm curious for both of you then now, what does that look like when a mom does need herself advocated for? And I know that like in your case, you're like, get the doula because that that's helpful. The doula can't advocate, but she can definitely be like, oh, that's not part of her birth plan or hey, dad, remember? And then it becomes a little easier to speak up. So like what would your recommendation be for dads in that case then? You know, that, that's such a great sticky point, Stephanie. I get that a lot. A lot of the dads I talk to, especially, you know, on the side, they're like, look, man, I'm not an OB like. I don't stand over my mechanic and like nitpick what he's doing with my car, much less. And you know, this is, there's beeps and machines. And like, I, why would I possibly imagine I know more about the safety of childbirth than somebody who spent eight years in school? That's like an absurd proposition you suggest to me. So why, why would I argue with them? And I say, that's a great point. And what you want to do ahead of time is to make sure that your birth team is been chosen by you you've had those conversations you know what is your if you assuming you know we talked about a hospital we had a hospital birth also is your ob somebody who's very more much inclined to support a low intervention natural childbirth progression or are they somebody who's more inclined to kind of give mom a chance but then you know if 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 things get a little squirrely, we're going to a C-section because I want to get the baby out right away. It's like, okay, and not that there's a wrong choice there, but you need to make sure that the people you have on your birth team are going to work with your preferences to the degree that their training and expertise um, will allow, allow them to. And another thing I like to remind guys is that it's almost always okay to ask for a little bit more time. <clears throat> if you're being given some suggestions. Um, You can always ask, you know, can I have just a few minutes to sort of sit with this? Because it's not really fair for a situation that's not emergent to have it be like kind of forced on us. We need to make a decision right away. It's like, well, I I don't, I don't know. So can I have a little bit more time? Can you, can you talk me through your decision tree? Like, why are you recommending this? As opposed to if you, what would you see if you saw what differently would you then recommend something else? Like you just want to try to keep some sense of what's going on, but it is really tricky. Like I, I don't recommend dads to try to like get into a fist fight with the OBs about something because like you're going to get yourself thrown out. And number one, number two, that's only going to make mom's anxiety and her experience more challenging. So, you know, having your doula there where you can sort of at least have a sounding board or um, you can ask for a second opinion, but it, but that's such a sticky area. And again, Stephanie, I definitely am not somebody to recommend immediately like going against whatever the medical advice is. You want to be very mindful that these people are trained professionals. And as long as you have somebody on your team that you feel is philosophically aligned with you, then you can trust that their expertise is being informed by their compassion and their intentions to work with you as best as possible. And they are making a recommendation based on the safety of mama and baby. And they know that it may be, you may need a few minutes to sort of like sit with that decision. So somebody who's like supporting you emotionally as well as medically would be my recommendation. I love it. Do you have anything you wanna add to that? Yeah, I think those are great points. Just asking the question, how concerned are you really with this or that we need to proceed with it this quickly? Or are there any other avenues you can think of? Yeah, I think those are top two, right? And this is something that I preach on my podcast. And I'll tell you, you know, it's kind of, I joke that it's this chicken egg situation, right? Like, do I take the birth class and like learn all the knowledge and get all the things or do I find a really good provider? And it's kind of like, you can't have one without the other. Like if you don't have the knowledge to know the questions to ask, you don't know that you're gonna have the provider you want for the birth that you want but it's on the top of the list. Like you have to be prepared and knowledgeable. If you're not surrounded, that provider has more to say about your birth experience and how it's gonna go than anything else that you're doing. So if you guys aren't aligned, like building that dream birth team, just like you talked about, you know, a doula and a provider that's gonna support those things, 
then you don't have to worry about going in fighting, right? Then you know when they make a recommendation or a suggestion that you can trust that person, and that's a big deal. Then the other thing that you talked about, which I absolutely loved, was making it conversational. So like as the mom in labor, I'm not having a conversation. I'm not going to be wanting to stop and ask a bunch of questions to you. I'm going to be like, no, you know, or okay, let's do that now. Um, and so for dad, I think that's like the perfect thing to have them do is like, oh, tell, tell me a little bit more about that. Or what if we tried this and just making it a conversation. So I really appreciate those talking points. That was like dead on. I love it. Oh, thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, it's, it's, it's we got to yeah. keep the dads, you know, we got to support them and not ask them too much. And this is, this is a great. That's a great t common topic yeah. that comes up. What what exactly is expected in that in that delivery room? Yeah. All right. Let's move on to postpartum. Um, unless you had anything else that you wanted to add for the the labor portion of things, um, but I'm curious. Like postpartum babies born, they're here, and I mean, there's a lot of things here, right? Make sure they don't cut the cord, and make sure that they didn't get this, and don't let them wash the baby yet, and right. They're, so back to all the questioning and things. But um, what are your like top tips once that baby is born? Well, my my number one tip is to and this is from the, you know, after baby's born and onward is I always tell the dads, get involved 100% from the jump, right from that first minute, like, or the first hour, let mama have her hour of golden time with baby skin to skin, but then dads get your skin to skin. Like, it's one of my strongest recommendations for that, that first few hours. Baby is used to hearing your voice, but not through baby's ears, but through the vibrations. So when baby is snuggled up skin to skin against your chest and, and you're talking, baby is getting your voice through the vibrations of your chest into their body. And they're like, oh, I, I know this guy. This is, this mm, is yeah. that guy that was there. They can start to get a sense of your smell, a sense of your, you know, your stubble or, you know, <laughs> you're just your, your energy and your vibe. You want baby to connect with you so that baby looks to you as a safe, supportive place um, as, as much as possible. And, you know, I think not, you know, I, I think it's safe to say, you know, us dads are never going to be moms, but we can, we can be a really close second. We can be skin to skin. We can be the comforting, the soothing. So that all starts in that first day baby's born, get your skin to skin time, lots of holding, snuggling, singing, humming, whatever it is, but you connecting and bonding with baby on your own channels um, independent and separate and in, in conjunction with mama doing her bonding with baby. I think that sets the stage for a much richer postpartum journey going forward than the dad who's in the waiting room passing out cigars and not yeah. there <laughs> connecting with baby uh, as, as early and often as possible. Yeah. yeah, I think we kind of had, with our first, we had a cesarean birth and I was kind of you know, they handed dad the baby and they worked on me. And I know that you said you didn't bond to him until later. Yeah. The, well, cause they were working on him as well. Cause when you don't pass through the birth canal, you don't expunge all that stuff from your lungs and everything that you're supposed to. And, and so they're working on him and I'm concerned with where she is because they take me out of the room with the baby. And so I don't get to be, you know, we just all the months building up to this and this whole ordeal. And then all of a sudden I'm supposed to just cut her off and go here. It was a very weird situation that I didn't care for, um, at all. And I had mentioned that we really didn't, I did really didn't get to connect to him until much later. Um, when we were sleeping and you know, when it, especially with your first, when the, you'll notice any change whatsoever on a microscopic level of breathing right, right. Uh, of anything motion like that and we're i'm holding him in my arms under one arm and we're sleeping on this really tiny chaise lounge thing in the hospital yeah, the dad cot <laughs> and uh yeah yeah it's exactly. like two feet wide it's like here you and, go dad uh, suck it up get in the corner yeah exactly <laughs> and you do though but because you're you're like i'll do it yeah sure it's there's plenty of space for us but uh yeah um and I, I'm sleeping there as best as you're really asleep with a newborn baby and all the concerns you have. And all of a sudden, I just notice a slight change in his breathing. And I immediately am snapped open. I'm, I look down at him. And all I can see in the pale of the, of the night light is just his eyes and he, his face. And he's up and he's staring at me. And in that moment, we had our connection. But, yeah, it uh, it matters. It, it matters. It yeah. matters. Well, I'm glad you guys were able to um, share that moment. That's 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 awesome story. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So I love to, you called the, um, you had like the title of like postpartum. It said the first trimester, fourth, sorry, the fourth trimester 
protect and serve. And I loved that you titled <laughs> that. I want to hear a little bit more about what it is to become a dad and that protect and serve that kind of, I feel like is probably instilled in you guys a little bit. Yeah, I think the that dad instinct of like, I'll become a dad when baby gets here. For a lot of us guys, it's almost like we've, like there's an, there's a plug that's never been plugged into anything and then baby gets here and it gets plugged in and we get sort of like, we get a jolt of like a different energy, like, oh shit, this is real now. Uh, this is game time, you know, like, okay. Um, and I think that brings in a certain degree of focus. It can bring in focus for a lot of guys, like, you know, whatever their hobbies or whatnot, they're kind of like, they get a shift in focus of like, oh, this, now I have a family. I need to, I need to start thinking beyond just what I have been thinking. I got to expand my focus and put my family at the center of it. So that can manifest in all kinds of ways. Some guys get more career focused. Some guys get more emotionally um, fluent and they can protect and serve their family by connecting. You know, ideally you're sort of like growing in a healthy, positive direction to all these avenues. Um, but the thing I like to remind dads out there is to have some balance with that because like they say in the old airplane, like you can't put the mask on your partner till you have your own mask on. So I think it's important for guys to remember to take, to, to still put a little bit of priority on taking care of themselves, whether it's making time to hit the gym or the treadmill at lunch or a half hour in the basement uh, on a boxing, you know, uh, you know, boxing ring thing or uh, just to run in the morning or whatever it is, but like take time to physically support yourself. Um, whatever your interests are, you know, change your commute where you're maybe you're listening to some audiobooks on the way into work. So you're still getting a chance to read. If you used to read at night, that's probably not happening so much now. So that you, when you are connect, when you are home, you are present and attentive and connecting to your family. Um, so I like to remind dads of that thing. A second thing I like to talk about a lot, this is not mentioned in the book, but has definitely come up a lot in some of the more postpartum work is I get a lot of questions about how to support mom during her postpartum journey, especially with like breastfeeding or, you know, taking care of baby. Like this is something that the dad's like, well, I can't do that, but I want to support that effort. <laughs> so I talk a lot about the comfort cart, which is a, basically it's a little cart you set up next to where, um, mama does most of her breastfeeding, even if, if you need two, one upstairs, one downstairs. But this comfort cart is your sort of like easy ticket to getting credit for being there, even if you're not there. You keep a little basket full of snacks, a little case of water. You yep. always make sure the water bottles are <laughs> topped off before you go to work. You have blankets on there, pillows, a charger, a nice frame picture of you and mama and baby. So when she sees that, the oxytocin starts flowing. But you can, you can put, look at it, your job is my job is to keep the comfort cart stocked and make sure that, that what's on there needs to be on there. So every time mama sits down, she has a fresh bottle of water, she has snacks, she's got the blanket, a heating pad or whatever the things are, but that way you, you're connecting to and supporting mama and her breastfeeding efforts. Even if you're at work all day long, you're still getting that sort of emotional connection by being having done that investment and supporting her before you left for work or when you get back home again. So there's lots of little tricks you can do, but just understanding that bigger role of protecting and serving and keeping a little bit of yourself in the center as, a, as an appropriate counterbalance, I think can really help a lot of the guys out there. I love it. Do you want to add to that? No, oh, I thought that's a fantastic idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we call them breastfeeding baskets, but I like the idea of having yeah. the dad be a part of that. And yeah, absolutely. I would feel loved by those things, you know? Yeah. So that's really awesome. All right. That's a good idea. I definitely want to give you an opportunity to talk about your book. Um, is there anything that you want to add about what they can find in the book? I, I want them to know how they can get their hands on it, how people can get in touch with you. So go ahead and throw all that at me. Sure. So the book is now available. Uh, it's on Amazon. Just welcome to fatherhood. You can see me on there. Um, it's now, uh, it's in Kindle and paperback. And then I just got the audiobook out recently. I did all the reading, so it's got all the proper inflection and tone and, and whatnot. Um, my voice awesome. is a little scratchy today, so it doesn't quite sound like today's voice. Um, but it's, it's the right, it's the right emphasis on the right points in there. A lot of guys that there have mentioned, they appreciate the audiobook cause they can put it in while they're driving to work or at the gym. And it's not, you know, the 19th book that they've been suggested recommended to read 
Yeah. They can clear, clear your bedside table of the other 18 and just focus on this one. Um, as I mentioned, I think briefly in the beginning, it's got two main components. There's big ideas, which are, hey, dads, think about this a little bit differently. And then there's the dad tips, which are do this, do that. And it's broken up according to the journey uh, through trimesters, first, second, and third, labor and delivery, and then that fourth trimester. It's not even 200 pages, so it's short, sweet, to the point. Um, a lot of guys appreciate that they are not being assigned a 500-page tome with all the intricate details. Um, you can find me on my website. That's the best place, www.welcometofatherhood.com. Uh, I have some great coaching opportunities on there for dads who want to get a little bit more involved, um, uh, support a little bit more uh, customized circumstance, you know, support customized to their particular circumstances. The dude zone to dad zone journey is the journey I take you on in the book. And I try to keep the dads, you know, on that journey. And that could be really tricky and different for each of the guys out there. Um, finally, I'm hoping to get a video version of the, of the book, like in a video class uh, out here pretty soon, early into next year. A lot of guys have been asking for sort of a series of videos they can sit down and kind of get a sense of what's going on, more like bite-sized pieces where it's not just like, you know, a book is just, it just sort of goes on, you know? So having small videos yeah. broken up in each of the dad tips. So that's kind of on deck. Hmm. Um, but again, the website's the best place to connect with me. I do have Instagram and Facebook, but uh, I'm not nearly as active on there as I should be. That's not quite my, uh, <laughs> my, my cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you guys, I have thumbed through the book. Like I said, I absolutely loved, like you said, it was like quick and to the point. They were actionable items that you could do right away. I even love how you have like bullet pointed, like you said, like dad tip, do this. Like here, you read this stuff, like dude, this is the thing you should have gotten out of there. Do this action. Um, and you even had some like, here's a scary moment, like, a, you know, pay attention to this. This could be scary, but here's what you do. I loved it. I absolutely loved the book. So, um, and I loved our conversation. So thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Stephanie, it was great being on here. Michael, nice chatting with you too. I really appreciate you guys making time to chat with me today. I love helping dads get more involved out there. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to connect with you and your audience.